God has blessed you in North Carolina in many ways. And one of the ways in which he has blessed you, which has been a witness to the world, is in some of the people that he has raised up right from your midst and has emboldened them with strength and with power, the likes of which I've just never seen before. There is a young man growing, who grew up in North Carolina. He was the ninth of 10 children. He lived in poverty. I'm not talking about he didn't have the latest iPhone. Not that kind of poverty. I'm talking real poverty. I'm talking about the kind of home that was so filled with challenges and difficulties that he and his siblings had to be farmed out to foster homes because there was not enough care and food just to sustain those kids. I'm talking about a person who knows what it is to sign up for his nation's military and volunteer to say, here am I, send me. I'm talking about a person who has lived a life like many people have lived, especially in North Carolina, having worked in factories, factories that closed down, not because the workers didn't do their work and do it well, not because they weren't good people, but because their own government sold them out and shipped those jobs to Mexico and to China and everywhere but places like North Carolina and things like the furniture industry that was once basically owned solely in this state, North Carolina, left ghost towns of places not because the competition was better across the ocean, but because our government and big multinational corporations decided that the people of North Carolina, the hardworking people who had given their life, blood, sweat, and tears, stood on hard concrete floors day after day and sweated through their clothes to the bone, that they weren't worth that much, and they closed those jobs, and they didn't care what happened to them. And among you, there was a person who experienced what so many North Carolinians experienced. Not a result of laziness, but a result of a lack of concern and leadership from the highest levels of government. He could have quit, could have become bitter, could have become angry, could have turned to crime, but he didn't. He turned to God. And he and his wife, built businesses, they worked hard, they worked honestly, and he was a good citizen, a good member of a church. And one day, the city council in the community where he lived in this state decided that they were going to make a decision that would affect his ability to protect himself, his wife, his home, his family. And he showed up at a city council meeting, not with a wonderfully written speech by somebody who was paid by the hour to write the words. He just showed up as a citizen with a burden and a heart filled with passion and a voice that thundered out so powerfully that 150 million people saw a speech before a city council meeting in North Carolina. I've made a lot of speeches. I've never had one that was seen by 150 million people. And it went viral because people said, what he's saying, that represents me. And you know what that really said? Is that the people who've been elected, they are not representing me, but this guy is. Well, he got some encouragement, and in 2018, after making that speech, a lot more encouragement, and in 2020, this last election, he actually ran for public office, never having done that before. People thought, ah, no way. Why, he doesn't have consultants and a big treasure chest of money. He doesn't have all the connections, but he connected to folks like you. And this great state elected a great man, a dear friend, 
that it is my distinct pleasure and honor to present to you for the closing message of this event, would you please welcome your Lieutenant Governor, Mark Robinson. right there. I see one right there. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank y'all. Is this thing on? Yeah, I think it's on now. Thank y'all so much. We appreciate y'all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Thank you, uh, Mike Huckabee, for that fantastic introduction. We appreciate that. And as always, we thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Got to say it every time. Got to say it every time, because for those of y'all that don't know, I catch plenty of flack about that on social media. Oh, stop with the religious stuff. Oh, stop that. This is not a Christian nation anymore. Oh, stop that. Too much religious fervor. First, let's deal with that whole religious fervor thing. It is because of my religion that I stand here today. It's because of Jesus Christ that I stand here today. If I lose my zeal for God, I will no longer stand in the place that he put me. You can't continue to stand where God put you without the God that put you there. And so we're going to continue to mention, man, as for this not being a Christian nation, yes it is. If you don't like it, I'll buy your plane, train, or automobile ticket right up out of here. You can go to some place that's not a Christian nation. As long as there is a remnant of his people in this place that continues to pray to him and for his wisdom, this will always be a Christian nation. It was established by him. When the founders said those words, when they wrote them down and declared them to the world and told them to a king that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by who? Their creator, not the Congress, not the Senate, not the king, but by their creator with certain inalienable rights. God Almighty heard that and said, there's a nation I can get behind, so this is still a Christian nation, and we still give him thanks because he is still worthy and always will be. So, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with pure insanity. That's what we're dealing with, pure insanity. I had the misfortune, and they should really, I think someone should invent eye bleach. Eye bleach should really be a thing, something that you can get to sprinkle into your hands and rub into your eyes so you don't have, you can unsee things. <laughs> I had the misfortune of looking on social media one Monday morning and looked and saw a picture of a biological man choking a biological woman in a cage in front of a screaming audience. Let me say that again. A biological man choking a biological woman in a cage in front of thousands of screaming fans. And the article said that this is progress. I looked at it for a moment and I said, surely to God this can't be true. And I opened the article up and I looked. Sure enough, this biological man who used to be a United States Army Special Forces soldier decided one day that, hey, I'm a woman. And decided to go into MMA and decided he was going to fight women. And he actually was in the ring fighting a woman. And here it is. I think I know why he might have got out of the men's division. Because that woman was giving him all he could handle. 
without that thick neck and that hard chin, I believe he'd have been on the canvas. But she couldn't overcome his male physique and he threw her down on the ground and climbed on top of her and was gleefully choking this woman in front of all these people. And this article called it progress. And I thought to myself, you know what it is? It is progress. It is progress. It's progress. Because it doesn't matter where you're going, you can progress. Even if you're sliding into the depths of hell, you can continue to progress right on in, down into the depths of hell. And that's exactly what that is. That one picture of that one man choking that one woman in that one cage in front of that one crowd of screaming fans is a microcosm of what's going on in America right now. We have turned our back on the wisdom of God and because we've had, he's turned us over to our most basic instincts. Don't even know whether or not we're women or men. Can't teach our children to read on a grade level. We're disarming law-abiding citizens and giving M4 automatic weapons and air forces to one of the most hated and most despised and most vicious terrorist organizations on the earth. All because we turned our back on God's wisdom. You see, when I was on the campaign trail a number, number of months ago, we used to talk about five different things. We used to talk about abortion. We used to talk about the Second Amendment. We used to talk about education. We used to talk about our veterans, and we used to talk about law enforcement. And you look at our society, those things are the underpinning of our society. Without any of those things, our society is less than. Without any of them, we are less than. And you look at how under attack each one of them is. Look how under attack they all are. And you think about the mind-numbing hypocrisy that goes along with it. You talk about abortion. <laughs> Remember back when George Bush was in office and everybody was complaining because they said George Bush was a uh, torturing terrorist. Remember that? Uh, you can't take those men down there to Guantanamo Bay and interrogate them and pour water in their faces and make them do a, you can't do that. They said that's un-American. That's inhumane to take these vicious terrorists down there and force them to tell them where they're going to set off the next bomb. Told us we couldn't do it. Meanwhile, those same people encouraging your children do whatever they want to do with their bodies and then when they get pregnant or, quote, get in trouble, run down there to the abortion clinic and slaughter their children. You see how that works? Don't want to kill our enemies on the battlefield. Don't want to lock our enemies up in prison. Don't want to take that terrorist and make him tell us where that bomb is and where the rest of his cohorts are. But they're ready at a moment's notice to slaughter an innocent child. And you look at the Second Amendment. It's simple, especially with old that guy that's in the White House now. Lord have mercy. You look at what's going on. When he was running for office, he told all of y'all out there, when they asked him, you gonna take away people's assault rifles? Bingo. Yeah, I'm gonna take away your, your assault rifle. I know you ain't got a criminal record. I know you ain't never threatened nobody, you ain't never beat your wife, ain't never beat your husband, never assaulted anybody. But I'm gonna take away your right to defend yourself. He told the world that. And still threatening to do it to this day. But when he had the ability to make sure the Taliban didn't have an Air Force and make sure the Taliban didn't have the M4 automatic weapons that you paid for with your hard-earned tax dollars, what did he do? Turn his back, turn the blind eye, and now he's completely denying it. That he armed the very entity that all of our soldiers went over there and died and fought, came home with PTSD and missing limbs. Totally turned it back over to him. And not only did he turn it back over to him, made sure they were in a better place now than they were when they started. 
Now you look at education. Take a look at education. Go ahead and say this right now on this stage. I have to sit in the state school board every month, the meetings every month. I have to sit there and listen whether I'm online or in person. And I sit and I listen and hear the words I hear every day. Equity, 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 equality, equity, equity. Don't hear nothing about education. Equity, 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 Leandro, 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 equity, equity. You know, I have made up my mind already that I have given up on that school board. I can say what needs to be said. I can make the argument as plain as the nose on your face. They're not going to listen because they're not there for your children. They're not there for those teachers. They're not there for anything except for the entity that they protect, which is the educational bureaucracy. The self-licking ice cream cone that does nothing but satisfy itself. <laughs> so I've made up my mind that I've got other plans. And I need to make them other plans, because you ain't got but a few years to make them plans to move forward and do something different in education for our children and for this state. But education in this state is a joke. Education in this nation is a joke. We got to turn it back into what it's supposed to be. And then you look at that issue of our veterans. Again, what's going on in Afghanistan is a perfect example. There's young men and women rolling around here right now, walking around here right now, standing around here right now, damaged in the mind, damaged in the body, damaged in the soul because they volunteered and signed up to go fight in Afghanistan. We got an ineffective, weak, spineless, jelly-backed government that gave their hard-earned victory right back to their enemy and were, are smiling while they did it and denying it all the way. Kamala Harris laughing like a hyena. And this strange... Joe Biden administration pulled another Vietnam, pulled another Saigon, and on the days it was happening, they sent Kamala Harris to Saigon. I don't believe that happened by accident. The disrespect that's been shown towards our veterans and the people that serve in our military is mind-numbing. This Millie, this General Millie, Lord, I want to meet this man face to face. I want to meet him face to face. I want to see him. I want to talk to him. I got some, me and him need to, we got some things we need to talk over. Like this comedian used to say, if I see him, I, something gonna happen. <laughs> this idiot sitting up testifying about white rage. You want to talk about rage? Let's talk about communist Chinese rage. Let's talk about the plans that the communist Chinese have to defeat the army that you're supposed to be leading. See, when I was in the army, the whole thing was all about beating Russia. Now I guess it's all about beating white rage and your political enemies. Now why am I talking about that? Because we're doing a disservice to every man, woman, and every man and woman who's ever served in that uniform by not keeping our military strong. All the hard work that we've done, they're washing it down the drain right now. We owe it to those young men, those men and women that have served in the past to serve with as much distinction as they have and to keep our military strong. And then you look at our police department. Don't get me started. I went to an uh, event today. It was a graduation ceremony, a small graduation ceremony, basic law enforcement. It was uh, 13 young men, 13 young men who have decided that they're going to put their lives on the line for their people, their, their family and their friends and their communities. Because, you know, that's exactly what police officers do. 
Uh, Black Lives Matter, y'all in here somewhere? I doubt it, but if y'all hear me, that's what police officers do. They put their lives on the line for their communities. We're out of our communities would not only be less than, our communities would not exist without those police officers. They are the underpinning of our civilization. As I stood in that room and I watched those young men come up and receive their certificates, and some of them were in tears. One young man, I think, was being sworn in by his grandfather and couldn't contain his emotion. And I looked out there and I saw, see, that's commitment. That's commitment. When you feel it in your soul so much that it comes out through tears in your eyes, that's commitment. We've got millions of young men and women across this country that have the same kind of commitment to their job. It's time for us to get back to honoring those folks, making sure that those folks know that we love them and we care for them and that we are going to support them and defend them, not defund them, because we need them. Now, I mentioned all those things, and why did I mention all those things? Here it is. The reason why I mentioned this, all those things is because of the place that we're sitting in right now. Where are we sitting right now? We're sitting in a church. And what's this clock counting down to? Is a bomb going to go off on that thing? What's that? Is that somebody going to eject? Am I going to get ejected off the stage when it hits zero? What is that? What's that thing? I thought... Thought maybe that was a James Bond movie or something. I thought I only had a few minutes, a few seconds left. I have to defuse the bomb real quick. So I say all those things because of where we're sitting now. We're sitting in a church. And what does the church have to do with all those things? Here it is. Every one of those issues I just mentioned is not a political issue. Every one of them is a spiritual issue. Every one of them is being attacked in this country because of spiritual warfare. You look at abortion. It don't get no more spiritual than that, folks. God himself tells us in his word. He knew us before he formed us in the womb. I don't need no blue-haired scientist to tell me that a baby in the womb is not a person. You didn't make that person. You didn't breathe life into that person. You didn't create that person. You don't get to define that person. God Almighty defines that person. See, I like, I like, that, old, I like that old joke about God and the scientists. Scientists have said, hey, we're smarter than God now. We figured out how to make a man. And said, if God is real, we challenge him. We challenge you to a contest. We'll make a man and you make a man. We'll see whose man looks best. God heard him and opened the sky and came down and said, I accept your challenge. Let's do it right here. And let's do it just like I did it at the creation of the world. And so God reached down and got him a handful of dirt and scooped it up. And the man said, yeah, we know that you did that and we know we got to do that too. And they reached down there to grab some dirt themselves, and God said, all right, you got to bring your own dirt. Don't grab none of mine. Go find your own dirt. You can make a man, you can make some dirt. Go find your own. Now that's a joke, but here's the truth in that joke. We think we're smarter than God. We think we know better than God. We got these guys up here at Harvard up here. All these people that all together, this conglomeration of religious leaders who decided we're going to make an atheist our leader. <laughs> yeah, because he's fair. <laughs> he, he's a wise man. He's fair. That's what they said this guy, they chose him because of his wisdom. And he's an atheist. Now, I don't know about Bible you're reading, but my Bible tells me the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Amen. This man has no fear of the Lord because he doesn't believe in it. And here these little chickens done decided they're going to get Wiley Coyote to lead them. <laughs> hey, guys, I got a great idea. There's a wolf out there, and he's really strong. I think he can protect us. You see, when God's wisdom leaves the building, something happens 
and it's called chaos. But we think we're smarter than God, and because we think we're smarter than God, we forgot that life in the womb is life indeed. We don't respect it anymore, so abortion is a spiritual issue that must be picked up on these pews. I'm going to tell you this, and I'm saying this. If you go to a church, and your pastor ain't preaching against abortion, uh, I ain't telling you to leave. But you need to go talk to him. Because I'm going to tell you, the first group that's going to be held responsible for all them dead babies, it ain't going to be Congress and it ain't going to be the Senate. It ain't going to be Raleigh and it ain't going to be Washington, D.C. It's going to be the pulpits of America. It's going to be the reverends of America. The ones who stood silent while the most innocent were slaughtered like cattle. The ones who stood silent because they were afraid they might lose a few dollars out of the collection basket. The ones that stood silent because they didn't want to be talked about or lied on. The ones that want to be popular and want you to think that you can do anything if you just have faith in yourself. Abortion is a spiritual issue that's got to be picked up by the church. It's time for the people of God to be the people of God again. Instead of being the people of CNN and ABC and CBS. Now, the Second Amendment is the same way. God gave you the ability to be able to defend yourself. Time after time in the Bible, it talks about people standing up and fighting for their nation, standing up and fighting against the enemy. God knows there's wicked people in the world and he wants you to protect yourself against them. So the Second Amendment is a spiritual issue that the church must pick up. The church must, must demand that its people honor God's will that we protect our freedom and our rights. And so the Second Amendment Church has to pick it up. And then there's that issue of education. Simple. Wouldn't be no education without the church. Wouldn't be standing. That schoolhouse wouldn't be standing. Harvard would not be standing if it was not for Christians. The schoolhouse down on the corner would not be standing if it was not for Christians. Education has become what it is because once upon a time, Politicians and judges decided that God had to leave the hallways of the schools. Now, I'm going to say something that might sound real controversial, but I don't know how many of y'all know me, but uh, controversy is my stock and trade. Because I'm going to go ahead and tell you like this. Everybody said they're looking for a hero. I ain't looking for a hero. I'm looking for a villain. And let me tell you what I mean by that. See, sometimes when everybody is doing the wrong thing, whether it be at work, or whether it be at the party, or whether it be at your house, everybody is running around doing the wrong thing that's harmful, that's gonna get somebody hurt, gonna get somebody killed, gonna ruin the business. Somebody has to be grown up enough to stand up and be the villain. And say, wait a minute, you got to stop it. Now, I know you're laughing and having fun and giggling and doing all this, but somebody's going to end up hurt. The business is going to go under. The school is failing. We got to stop it. And when you do, everybody's not going to like it. Matter of fact, some people ain't going to like it at all. You're going to get hammered. You're going to get canceled. You know, I don't know what they're trying to cancel me from. I don't think I was ever a member. <laughs> so I'm not concerned about saying controversial things, and I'm not concerned about saying what I'm going to say right now. I'm tired of turning on my TV after a school shooting and watch folks come together on school grounds where they done told me I can't pray, 
I can't bring my Bible, can't mention my God, can't say nothing about Jesus Christ. But soon as there's a school shooting, everybody's in the church, everybody's down at the schoolyard praying. Now you done run him off your property. But soon as there's trouble, here you come. We're gonna have a prayer vigil down at the school because we had a shoot. You know, it seems uh, quite easy to me, sir, if you had had that prayer vigil before that shooting. If you had let God come in that building before that shooting. If you had told those students, Jesus Christ is the way and the light and only through him can you receive salvation. Wouldn't have been no school shooting. It's too late now. Your little half-hearted attempts at soothing Jesus Christ, it's not going to work. You done kick God out of your schools. The children don't know whether they're men or women. They're murdering each other with impunity and can't read on a grade level. All because you done turned your back on the wisdom of the man that built that schoolhouse you in. Like the old folks say, I turn the TV on and see it, it chaps my hide. You know, I'm elected official. I'm not supposed to say stuff like that. I'm sure it's a, somebody from one of them news agencies back there right now. That boy got his pencil out right now. Uh, Mark Robinson, nothing like prayer vigils. <laughs> you say what you want to say. You can get in line behind all the people that don't like me, and I don't mind that. They didn't like Jesus either. So, still don't like him. So, I'm in good company. That schoolhouse, you know who needs to be down there at them school board meetings? You need to be the pastor. And he need to have a whole parcel of his parishioners following behind him. Because if we're going to get this thing right, he needs to get right by God first. You know all these people running around here talking about, I want to be on the right side of history. You go on over there and be on the right side of history in hell and knock yourself out. I stay on the right side of God. I'll take his side. You can have that right side of history. We got to pick that mantle up and carry it. And our veterans, our police officers, what the Bible tell us about them folks? It said, no greater love has a man than he lay down his life for his friends. Who does that describe? That describes those men on Bunker Hill that laid down their lives for a nation and a freedom that did not exist. Now you think about that. The founding fathers, I, I, I had a fellow one time and told me, said that he was talking bad about the founding fathers. And I looked at him and I said, you don't know nothing about the founding fathers because you'll never be the man them men were. And here's why. Because see, I saw this same young man wearing a shirt that said, free-ish since 1865. Hey, free-ish. Not free, free-ish. And I asked him when I saw that shirt, what is that supposed to mean? He gave me something that some leftist professor he heard on CNN say. Some ridiculousness. And I said, why do you need any other person to tell you that you're free? And listen to this. The founders were not free when they crafted the Declaration of Independence. But they wrote to the most powerful king on earth and said, hey, king, guess what? We are free. Now you might send your soldiers over here to shoot at us. You might even get us and take us back to England in chains. But no matter what you do to us, we are free men. They declared their freedom before it was realized in reality because they believed it in their heart. And that's the only way you'll ever be free. Freedom doesn't come because you broke the chains. Freedom comes because you don't recognize the chains. You don't give credence to the chains. You don't give 
strength to the chains. You shake the chains off before they ever broken and declare in your heart that because Jesus Christ came here and saved your soul, you are free. And our founders did just that. And so, when you think about that freedom, you think about those men on Bunker Hill, you think about those men at a place like Gettysburg or Fredericksburg, or you think about those men at a place like Iwo Jima, a hell that most of us couldn't even imagine. You think about Quezon and Porkchop Hill in Korea, Quezon in Vietnam, and you think about 9-11. Think about the Gulf War. Think about these wars in Afghanistan. No greater love than a man should lay down his life for his friends. You think about those 13 young Marines and that sailor who died in Afghanistan, standing on the parapet for freedom for you and me. It's ever a cause the church needs to pick up. It's the cause of young men and women who wear the uniform in these foreign countries and in our military and in our police and our fire and our EMT. People that when you hear that siren going off into the distance, you don't have to worry because someone else has picked up the mantle and they're going towards the trouble, not running away from it. The church needs to pick up the mantle for those folks and carry it and honor those folks and tell Black Lives Matter that if black lives really mattered, you wouldn't be talking to the police. Uh, you'd be talking to Planned Parenthood. I was, I was standing in the airport one time and there was a fella that I had an NRA hat on. And he said, uh, NRA, huh? Well, that's not very smart. Excuse me? Well, NRA. Now, what do you want to be tangled up with an organization like that for? What do you want, blood on your hands? I looked at him and I said, I don't have any blood on my hands. I mean, I would if my hat said Planned Parenthood. <laughs> and this guy insisted. He said, you know, I, I, you know, you can say what you want. I just don't think it's very smart for a guy like you to be wearing an NRA hat. And I looked at him and said, you know, it's not smart to bother a very irritated, road-weary, 350-pound black man who's wearing an NRA hat. That's not very smart. Maybe you ought to rethink this, sir. But now all the causes I just named, all those things that I just named, there's other things too that we gotta think about. We gotta think about this thing called election integrity. Yeah. Not only do we gotta think about it, we gotta do something about it. Yeah. I get calls daily about it. Now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna tell y'all in this form what I think about election integrity. Here's my opinion. All right, 2016, what happened? Everybody said, over on this side, said, Russia, 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 Russia. Russia, Russia, the Russians interfered in our election. Yeah, you got to do something about this foreign election and all that. Our election system is not right. It's broken, blah, 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 blah. Fast forward, 2020. Everybody on our side is now saying the election system is broken. They cheated. There's no way any 80 million people voted for Joe Biden. Guys, if I had to guess, if they let him do it by himself, I'm not sure Joe Biden voted for Joe Biden. <laughs> Currently, my favorite meme on Facebook right now is a picture of Joe Biden looking confused going, oh my God, when is Trump coming back? I suck at this. <laughs> but here it is. And I want you to follow me when I say this. Election integrity, election reform is absolutely essential to the survival of our constitutional republic. It is essential, but in fighting for it, 
We cannot fight for election integrity and election reform from the right side or the left side. We can't do it holding a Biden flag or a Trump flag. We've got to hold the American flag. That is the only way we're going to get this thing done because here it is. I don't want elections to be fair for Republicans. I don't want it to be fair for Democrats. I want them to be fair for America. America needs to put its all into its democratic process. We have the greatest country in the world, but currently the underpinning of our republic, our democratic process is broken. Your Amazon account is more secure than your vote in this country. That is an indictment of our government. And while I believe that both sides should come together and sit down at the table and fix this problem, I also believe this, that anybody that doesn't want to is part of the problem and needs to go. You don't want to sit down at this table and fix this problem. You need to go. Because without secure and fair and honest elections that the citizens trust, we will not have a nation. And again, that's an issue that the church needs to pick up because God gave us this nation. It's our duty to be good stewards over it. And so now what do we need to do about all this? What do we need to do? What do we need to do? Number one thing we need to do is we need to get more connected to the God who gave us our freedoms. That's number one. We need to stop paying God lip service and start paying him foot service and hand service and prayer service. We need to start making his presence plain in our lives. Not your neighbor's life. In our lives. We need to speak his name without fear or embarrassment, no matter where we are. That's number one. Number two, what do we need to do? We need to be diligent, diligent about who it is that we go to the polls and push that button for. We need to make sure that we are pushing that button for people who are not ashamed to witness for Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that we are pushing that button for people who know that life in the womb should be protected. We need to be pushing that button for people who believe in that Second Amendment, who believe that you should be in charge of your children's education and that children should be educated, not indoctrinated. We should be voting for people who believe that our veterans should be taken care of and that law enforcement should be defended, not defunded. That's who we need to be pushing that button for. Third thing we need to do is this. You can't find somebody good enough to do it in your area, and you need to get up and go do it yourself. It's time for the average American person, the average American citizen, that factory worker, that teacher, that guy that grew up without any money, that guy that ain't got no money right now, that veteran, the man in the wheelchair, the woman that comes from the broken marriage or the broken home that's been abused. It's time for them to stand up and take their experiences into the halls of government and fix it because what the problem is in government now is this. We have too many people who have political experience and not citizenship experience. We got people in Washington, D.C. They can give you a speech out of a can about how they ought to tax the rich and spread the wealth, and you ask them, they can't even tell you how much a gallon of milk costs. Couldn't tell you the last time they had to try to string two nickels together to make it. Forgotten about the hard times that they grew up in, if they grew up in hard times. They're out of touch, out of the way, and out of their minds. They need to be replaced with citizens that are going to do the will of their fellow, fellow citizens. That's the last thing we need to do. And here it is. In this state right now, 
politically speaking, we're in a good, good place. We're in a very good place. Got a lot of great people in state office. But there's one office in this state that needs fixing in a big way. Got a guy in that office right now, he doesn't know whether he's the governor or the king. He walks around all pompous, looking down his nose at everybody, telling you you can't open your business and you can't go to church, telling you to put mask on a six-year-old. What in the world? 30,000 people down at the stadium down there at NC State, Carolina, piled up all over each other, hollering drunk, Screaming in each other's faces, kissing one another. Your child, six foot apart in the kindergarten class with a mask on. Common sense has left the building. And wisdom went out right behind it, mumbling, I'm not coming back. <laughs> we got a problem in that top seat in this, in this, uh, in this state. And uh, I ain't making no declarations. I ain't making no declarations, but I can tell you what this state needs. This state needs somebody that knows North Carolina. It needs somebody that's been North Carolina. And not just been North Carolina at the top, going to all the right schools, making all the right connections, and making all the right political moves. It needs somebody that's fallen down, but got back up again. It needs somebody when they stand in front of a, another factory worker that's lost their job and they see them tears running out of their eyes because they don't know what they're going to make, what the next move is going to be. Not only knows what them tears feel like, but had them in their own eyes themselves. It needs somebody that when they talk to these teachers out here, they're concerned about CRT and all the wickedness that they see in school. They need somebody that's not just going to put their hands on their shoulder and say, I understand. They need somebody that's going to take a step back from them and put their hands on their hips and point at them and say, you are the reason why. And I will defend you. And I will fight for you. Even if it costs me everything. You see, because what this state really needs is they don't need a politician. What this state needs is somebody with the courage of John the Baptist. If you don't know the story of John the Baptist, here it is. He came to earth, proclaimed the name of Jesus, told the king of truth, and lost his head because of it. But he never backed down, and he was never sorry for standing up and telling the truth in God's name. And Jesus Christ called him the greatest person ever born to a woman because of it. You see, that's what this state needs. State doesn't need a king or a dictator. This state, this state needs somebody that is this state. Now, I ain't saying who that person is. I'm not saying who that person is. But I can tell you this. Like Johnny Cochran once famously said, or not jo Johnny Cochran didn't say that. Johnny Cochran didn't, forgive me, Johnny Cochran didn't say if the, Johnny Cochran said if the glove don't fit, you must have quit. <laughs> Johnny Cochran did not say if the shoe fits, wear it. <laughs> and so because that's what we need, that's what I'm telling you now. If the shoe fits. She got me. She got me. She got me. You got me. You got me. You got me. Hey, she got me. I had to get this lady to hire her for my campaign.
because she got me. Guys, seriously, seriously, let's remember who we are as North Carolinians and Americans. Let's remember that God has blessed us richly. Let's remember that when we fight, we don't fight, from a, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. See, because I can flip over that book and I can flip over there to the back page back there, that last verse back there, and the last verse on the last page. And we win. This is an instant replay like an old Dallas Cowboy game. We win. So don't fight for victory, fight from victory because remember who is standing behind you. You might be old, you might be bent over, you might be not too educated. You might not be a great speaker. You might not be a great communicator. You might not be a great organizer, but you remember who stands behind you. It's the same God that stood behind Moses at the Red Sea and the same one that stood behind David when he faced, faced Goliath. He's the same one that was present in every battle this nation has ever faced. He's the same one that faced, stands with us as we face the battles we face now. So everybody in this room, I urge you, Let's stand strong and stay strong in the name of God. And let's be proud to be North Carolinians and let's be proud to be Americans because there's no greater nation on earth. Let's fight to save both and continue freedom for generations to come. God bless you all. God bless this church and this state. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. God bless you.